So all was done with Luther, but I wanted to bring up our chart again and do a quick comparison between Augustine, Aquinas, and Luther. So Augustine, remember, sets the theological vocabulary for the Western tradition, out of which both Aquinas and Luther come. Um, and so there's going to be a lot of similarities among the three, but also some really significant differences on one really important point. So, God. You're going to talk about God in different ways. You're going to emphasize different things, but none of these are incompatible. Um, we emphasize, for example, with Aquinas, his ideas of God as unmoved mover, but, you know, creator source of all that's good. Aquinas believes that too. One to be trusted, commander, and promister. I mean, no one's going to disagree with that. Um, Jesus, mediator, son of God, they're all Trinitarian. They all agree with Nicaea. They all agree with Chalcedon. Um, they are, they're working within that theological milieu. The human problem, they um, begin to navigate a little bit differently, but they all are within the Augustinian framework where we have original guilt um, and really the inability to choose the good. So in that way, Aquinas and Luther are very much part of the Augustinian tradition, thinking through what um, the human problem is in terms of uh, an original sin, meaning original guilt, and an inability to choose the good. They're going to think about that a little differently in, in various points, but that's the framework. As we said with Aquinas, um, he's going to do much more than Luther at sort of figuring out exactly how bad we are and how good we are and what we can do and what we can't do. Luther is more interested in just saying, look, you suck. Um, I didn't put that in the chart, but that is basically what he's saying. You're bound to death. You're unable to obey God's commands. I mean, who cares what little good, I mean, though you can make a vineyard. Um, Luther just thinks existentially you have to realize how bad you are off. Um, again, Aquinas doing a little bit more fine-tuning, but both still working in this Augustinian framework. Where they differ is on this category, right relationship. Don't differ completely, but they do differ. All three are going to say that right relationship with God comes through grace. Um... And the logic of all three says that we don't choose it in any sense. Now, that's the logic of predestination we talked about with Augustine. You see it in Aquinas, although Aquinas doesn't want to say it as strongly as Augustine. Luther doesn't want to talk about predestination. Um, we'll talk next week about Calvin, who does. But certainly they all have a very strong sense that grace comes from God's side to us. That we are recipients, we're not, we are not agents in the receipt of grace. Um, God's grace acts upon us. Um, and then the next point is where they really do differ. Um, so for Augustine, God gives us grace and fills us with God's love. And that's pretty much where he stops. Um, Aquinas is close to that. It's close to the Augustinian read of that. God gives grace to humans and infuses them with that grace, with charity, with love. And so they become, or people become better, and in the process of becoming better, at some point God says, you're justified. Where does that happen? In the process. Okay. So it's grace. God gives you grace. God infuses God's, and I'm, I'm, I'm making that word big for a reason, infuses charity into you, infuses justice into you. You become a better person. At some point, God says, okay, you're, we're good. You got to you keep going. But um, we are now to the point where I'm going to call you justified. That is not late medieval nominalism, but even that Luther doesn't like. Because Luther's question is, okay, okay, Aquinas, we're in the process. When am I justified enough? When have I cooperated enough with God's grace? What Luther says is that God gives us grace, meaning God looks at us and just sees Jesus, and that happens before we've changed an iota. It doesn't depend on our change. Justification doesn't happen somewhere along the process of us becoming better people. God justifies us. And then certainly Luther wants to say, you will want to become better because, of course, you would. Why wouldn't you? God's been so great to you. But you aren't being justified because you become better. God justifies you. 
and then out of your own sense of gratitude, you will become holier, okay? So again, note, Aquinas infuses, not Aquinas, in for Aquinas, God infuses charity, justice into you, and you become a better person. Like you actually become changed, um, a holier person, and somewhere on that path of holiness, God justifies you. For Luther, God imputes, God credits to your account Jesus' righteousness. And then you will want to become better. Um, but it's not infusion, it's imputed. So Aquinas, infuse, God infuses goodness into you, charity into you, and you become better and you're justified. Luther, God imputes, credits you with Jesus' righteousness, and then you will spontaneously want to become a better person. Just to finish off our story here, um, I think it's worth thinking about um, which of these views you think is more compelling. Um, more, are you more Aquinas? Or are you more Luther? Why? Um, which, which do you think makes more sense? Um, I will say that a lot of times Christians don't really, I mean, Christians prioritize one or the other. Some people try and kind of keep some of this in conversation. Um, I had a professor once who said that if you're talking to a group of people who is just petrified of God, then preach Luther at them. Um, if you have a bunch of people who's out, you know, doing the moral equivalent of sipping lemonade as the world burns, then they need a good dose of Thomas Aquinas. Um, but most people prioritize one or the other, and they have some real significant differences that would play out in how you understand the Christian life. Finally, I will say that after Luther, the, council, the Catholic Church called a major council um, in response to Protestantism and some of its critiques. The Catholic Church reformed somewhat in some of the, the practices that were causing problems. They worked at some of the corruption, but they did reiterate basically the Aquinas view or the Thomistic view of justification. So the Council of Trent, which meets in the 16th century, says, Justification is not only a remission of sins, but also the sanctification and renewal of the inward man through the voluntary reception of the grace and gifts whereby an unjust man becomes a just and from being an enemy becomes a friend. So not just a remission of sins, um, but an actual change. And then I'm going to go at this bottom one here. They say very clearly, the Council of Trent, if anyone says that the sinner is justified by faith alone, I love that, by the way, like if anyone were to say this, Anyone just happens to say this, um, you know, anyone named Luther, for example, happens to say that the sinner is justified by faith alone, meaning that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to obtain the grace of justification, and that it is not in any way necessary that he be prepared and disposed by action of his own will, let him be anathema. So in other words, the Council of Trent says, no, Luther, you're wrong. We still think that justification is something that happens through the grace of God, but in the process of sanctification, and humans do have to cooperate in it through the grace of God, but there is real cooperation. So the Catholic Church maintains a different understanding of justification than does Luther. Um, at the end of the 20th century, the Catholic Church and the Lutherans did create a joint statement on justification, talking about places where they agreed, and they said, we agree on a lot, but they still do disagree. Um, and I think infusion and imputation is still a pretty big difference for Lutherans and Catholics. And there we have Luther. Next week we'll do um, John Calvin and my man, John Wesley. See you then.